we have Jason Servo, who is born in Kansas City, Kansas, but is a native of Colorado, as his mother moved is currently a senior criminal investigator with the Denver Attorney's Office, where he's been since 20. Prior to that, he was a detective with the Douglas County Sheriff's Office, where he worked as a property detective and the criminal intelligence officer, followed by the cold case unit corporal. Prior to the 14 years he spent at the Douglas Sheriff's Office, Jason had an additional eight years experience as a patrol officer in several agencies in Colorado and Kansas. Prior to his paid law enforcement career, he was a police officer in high school and a police On this one, I haven't done this before, so I'm not sure if you guys wanted to ask any questions about my job. I do have a, a PowerPoint presentation to go over on one of the courses. I'm sure we'll have a lot of questions. <laughs> Just maybe a quick overview of. So a DA is investigator. Um, like some of you have already said, you watch Blue Blood. You know, there's a DA investigator on that. Uh, unfortunately, Denver is even a weirder animal because there are lots of scenes and help out with investigations. At uh, base, as an investigator with the Denver DA's office, he is also collect evidence, from his evidence bureau, and bring it over for trial. And then when the trial's done, we take it back. We don't do quite as much as some of the other district attorneys. Try on the audio, or uh, let's give that a try. Yeah, you're you're connected there, right? Yeah. Is that better? Maybe not. Can you hear me? Still the same? How about now? They're saying they can hear me. Okay. Uh, any questions on that? Or would you like to look at the PowerPoint now? Or how would you like to do that? PowerPoint? PowerPoint? All right. Okay. So the PowerPoint, I'm going to share my screen here. You guys see my screen? Yes. Okay. Let me go to my PowerPoint here. So the PowerPoint I'm going to go over is uh, the cold case investigation I was involved in with the Helen Przinsky case. It was a case from 1980 that we recently solved, uh, 2019 and 2020. Open there. Sorry. Okay, so Helen Przinsky, uh, she was a Denver uh, intern with Denver KHOW uh, radio in 1980 uh, when she disappeared and was uh, her body was found the next morning. We're going to go into a little bit of that. Uh, there was a lot of investigators that worked in this case uh, over the years. I ended up getting involved in the case in 2017 when I uh, entered into the cold case unit 
and that's when uh, a lot of the genetic genealogy stuff started happening with the Golden State Killer, and that's how we got involved in uh, identifying the killer in this case. So uh, on January 17, 1980, the body of 21-year-old Helene Przinsky was found in a field on Daniels Park Road, which is in Douglas County, Colorado. If anybody knows Douglas County at all, uh, the area that she was found in the field is now uh, a large church parking lot uh, right there in Douglas County. Uh, the manner of death was most likely blood loss from the nine apparent stab wounds she had to her back. Um, it was believed that she was abducted near South Broadway and Union Avenue, walking from the bus stop, returning home from her internship. Uh, right here on the screen, this is, uh, if anybody knows Inglewood at all, this is Frank's Pizza. Uh, it's been there forever and still there. And uh, she would take the bus north on Broadway to the KHOW radio station. And then in the evening, she'd take it southbound and get off at this stop and walk a few blocks to her aunt and uncle's house, who she was staying with while she was in Denver. So, sorry here. Uh, she had been uh, sexually assaulted, and uh, her body was left half clothed in the field. Uh, with stab wounds through her coat. Uh, she was bound with the, her own purse strap. Um, her pants, shoes, underwear, and purse uh, were never found. Uh, she was left in the field without those. We believe the suspect had taken those for a, a type of trophy. Uh, she had been staying with her aunt and uncle on South Pennsylvania Street. As you can see in here, the bus stop is pretty much a straight line down Union Avenue to Pennsylvania where she'd go up and just walk to her aunt and uncle's house. So it wasn't that far of a walk. Uh, I have a, hopefully these videos work for you, but I have a couple of small videos each are within between one and four minutes. Let's see if I can play this here. There we go. Hold on just a second, I get the sound on. So, sorry about that. So a psychological profile and crime scene analysis was developed by Special Agent John Douglas of the Behavioral Science Unit at the FBI. I don't know if you guys have seen the, the show uh, Mind Hunters. It talks about uh, John Douglas a lot. He was brought out for this case. Uh, the pro 
profile he made was based upon his past experience, personal interviews with serial killers and other uh, violent offenders, and also research in the area of homicidal personalities. Um, he did complete a comp uh, actually an agent with the Colorado Bureau of Investigation did complete a composite sketch uh, done by a witness that was driving by the uh, location of the body dump the night we believe that Helen's body was dumped. Uh, she did see a guy standing at the back of his car. The headlights were off, but the brake lights were on, or the rear lights were on, and she saw him at the back of the car. He tried to duck down behind the car to hide himself from her when, he was, when she was driving by. They actually went through a series of a session of hypnosis with the witness so they could pull out uh, more from her memory for the composite sketch, and it's kind of hard to see here. I don't know if you guys can see that being blocked by the pictures here, or can you see the composite sketch? Okay. So that's the composite sketch that was uh, made by the Colorado Bureau of Investigation agent. So uh, the victimology, Helen Przinsky, uh was a, a crime of opportunity. Her personal background indicated that she would not place herself in situations or with people she did not know. Um, when she was at uh, college in Wheaton, Illinois, uh, she was a, uh, I forget the name of it, but she helped out uh, the new students that came in. She was like a floor manager for the dorm, and she actually taught uh, rape crisis and rape prevention uh, classes. And so she, we believe that she tried to use a lot of the techniques that she was teaching other students and it just didn't work out for her uh, the way it should have. Um, but simply said she was in the wrong place at the wrong time and indications where she did not know her assailant. The crime scene uh, reflected that the offender did not know what to do with the victim after he assaulted her. Um, that he was not creative and did not methodically plan the abduction and disposal of the victim as the victim was disposed of in an isolated area, however, in full view of passing motorists. Uh, we think and we know now after the fact that he did not really know the area that well and he took uh, a drive until he thought he wouldn't see anybody because it looked like a, desert, a desolate search stretch of road and he decided to uh, dump the body. As you can see, uh, it's kind of hard to see, but the, her body is up here in the field. That's about how far it was away from the roadway because this fence line is the, where the roadway is. And as the witness uh, the night before was driving by, she was she didn't see the body, but the person in the morning that actually saw it was driving to work. Um, what he didn't know is that there was a small uh, enclave of houses that were further down. Uh, there were It was a rural section of road, but there was a new uh, housing project going up and there are people already living there and so they were leaving to go to work in the morning and someone saw the body when they were leaving. He thought, uh, the suspect thought that she wouldn't be found for a while because it looked like a desolate area. So the subject did find the victim using personal items of his and the victims. Um, the personal items of his that he used uh, was there was a strip of a green sweatshirt that was ripped off that he used uh, as a makeshift gag and he used uh, the strap from her purse to tie her hands. Uh, this indicated that he acted alone at the time of the crime, and once abducted her, he now had to transport her from the populated city to the isolated crime scene area without being detected. And it's a little easier in the cover of darkness, but again, he thought he was out in the middle of nowhere and no one would find her body for a while. Uh, the roadway itself had uh, several tire impressions. There were a few motorcycles and a few cars, but there was one particular set of tires. There were snow tires that pulled up right to where we believe the car stopped to have Helen walk out into the field. Uh, a set of footprints went around the front of the vehicle from the driver's side to the passenger side and then down the embankment towards the fence uh, with two sets of prints crossing over the fence. One of those sets were made in stocking covered feet which were believed to be those of Helen Przinsky. Uh, the second set of prints were cowboy boots. Um, they were found uh, to be a size 10 and a half Western boot with a walking heel uh, the stride was 38 inches to 39 inches, and the footprints were in snow, and both sets were casted. Uh, what was interesting about the, the boot print was there was a, a series of sexual assaults that were occurring along the Broadway corridor in Inglewood and Littleton during the time. Um, and there was also another set uh, of burglary sexual assaults that were occurring on the secondary streets away from uh, on the other either side of Broadway. Uh, it was determined later that the Broadway uh, sex assaults and kidnappings were most likely related to our one victim, while the other series on the outskirts of Broadway 
were connected by one or more other people. It just uh, Inglewood at the time happened to be a pretty busy area for sex assaults. A lot of people didn't know that back in the 80s. But they had uh, Cinderella City going on, and there was a lot of stuff happening from Cinderella City. Uh, girls were getting sexually assaulted left and right over there, unfortunately, back in that era. Uh, the victim, Helen Przinsky, was a smart, kind, and well-liked 21-year-old college student from Hamilton, Massachusetts. And I'm sorry, I said Wheaton College in Illinois, but it was in Massachusetts that she went after high school. Uh, she was five months from receiving her undergraduate degree, and unfortunately, when she disappeared and her body was found, she was within one or two weeks of leaving Colorado and going back to Massachusetts to finish her degree. Um, so she was almost out of here before um, this happened to her. I'm going to hold off on that. Looks like we lost uh, the picture here, so we're going to wait a second. Uh, the FBI was thinking that he was anywhere from 5'8 to, to 6 foot. But they also had to take into account that he may have been walking faster because he was trying to get out of there. Um, but they, that's, I think that's how they got the big uh, height range. Is that back on? Almost. Okay. I don't want you guys in the room to miss it either. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not usually this much of a jinx, but I guess tonight I am. Yeah. Which department do you work for now, uh, DPD? Uh, right now I work for the Denver District Attorney's Office as a criminal investigator. How, how does the, uh, the DA and the... And the uh, look upon cold cases. Is it just stuff that uh, it was 10 years ago, that was 20 years ago? I don't, don't care anymore. I got cases to worry about now. Or, I mean, is it a waste of manpower? No, it's not a waste of manpower. Um, DPD has a full time uh, cold case unit. I'm not sure how many people, how many detectives they have assigned. Uh, the last I heard, I thought there was at least two. But uh, within the past year and a half, two years, uh, the Denver DA's office actually made a separate cold case. Uh, unit within the DA's office where they have a, a criminal investigator and uh, at least one district attorney assigned to that to work just cold cases to assist Denver PD uh, getting things done that they need done like DNA testing, uh, work in search warrants and uh, arrest warrants just for cold cases. So it's, oh. it's not something that has, as they say, gone out of style. It's just that I think they finally uh, saw the light with uh, some of the that were going on around the nation and they were able to actually get taxpayers to, to foot the bill to pay for those positions. It's just kind of a, it's one of those things that with everything, it takes money. Are there a lot more cold cases? Um, you know, I don't think it's really because of volume. Mostly it's because um, a lot of the cold cases, especially the older ones, especially even the one that we worked here from 1980, we were lucky that we had DNA. But uh, sometimes DNA, uh, or not sometimes, but always, DNA corrupts. It depends on how it was stored, how it was collected. Um, a lot of times you'll run into things where a pipe bursts in the lab and stuff gets destroyed. Or back in the day, they just didn't realize that DNA was important enough to, to collect. And so you have a lot of cases that you might have some circumstantial evidence on, but you just don't have the DNA to go on. 
and or suspects may have died before they even ever admitted to anything to anybody. Um, and there may not have been DNA left because they may have used a condom or something else, and there just wasn't any DNA evidence to follow up on. So I think that's really the big roadblock on a lot of cold cases is you just don't have that DNA sometimes that's either good enough to test or to have it at all to test. And then because of that, you're, you're going to have a backlog of cold cases that really, for the most part, aren't solvable with today's technology because there's nothing to use that technology on. And so that just kind of, kind of backlogs it a little bit, but I think that's the biggest hurdle. Well, you know, it's not always new witnesses. You also have to go through, um, what I did as a cold case investigator is I'd go through all the cases and I'd triage the cases. And I'd say, which ones have DNA? Those are the ones that we're gonna work first. Because we can get those sent off to the lab to get stuff done. And while we're waiting for those results, I can either do uh, re-interview witnesses, try to find new witnesses, or hopefully this guy is dying somewhere and he's willing to give a deathbed confession and, and somebody calls you. I mean, that happens rarely, but it does happen. Um, you will get a call from somebody saying, hey, this guy just died. I was scared of him back in the day, but here's what he, I know about what he did. And sometimes that solves the case. Um, I mean, on this case, we had uh, one person that was uh, talked about in old reports. It was a cousin uh, of hers, her cousin's husband, was really shady character and he was alone with her a little while before uh, she ended up disappearing like a day before she disappeared and so i had the name didn't have a date of birth i knew who he was married to which was her cousin but no one had ever talked to him so i had to hunt him down try to find him by the time i found out who he was and what his date of birth was and talk to the cousin that had been married to him um we found out that he had died uh but luckily for us an autopsy had been done because it was kind of a suspicious death and so I was able to get with the coroner in Kentucky where he died, and uh, they took uh, slides of his liver and some other uh, major organs, and they saved them, um, which they do in suspicious deaths. And so I was able to get them to send us uh, some of those slides so we could test the DNA against the DNA left on uh, Helen. And luckily it was not him uh, that was the suspect, because that would have been even worse if it was a family member like that. But uh, we found out a lot through a background investigation with him that he was a really bad guy. He was a drug dealer. Um, he was really violent towards his wife. So he really fit the profile, but uh, it just took a lot for us to be able to eliminate him. But sometimes you just have to look through these cases and go, what has not been done that should have been done? And you don't really blame those guys from 1980 because, one, you had CBI coming out to help you, uh, the Colorado Bureau Investigation, because even though Douglas County is a big agency now back then, it was still a lot of rural area, and you just didn't have a lot of homicides. So you had to call in another agency to help you that had that experience. And then through the years, you had different detectives going through things, and everybody's looking for that, that big leap in the DNA or whatever else. And sometimes those names just get forgotten in the file. And that's why you just kind of have to take a fine-tooth comb and go through that file because you're going to find names that were left out or someone writes a name and a question mark but then that investigator's dead and you can't ask him why he wrote that name in a question mark. So you have to go through and just try to back step or uh, back work his steps to find out why he came with that name and why is it I only saw it in one place on a, on a notepad that was booked in and it's nowhere else. Do I need to really look at that guy? Do I need to eliminate him? And unfortunately in 1980 with this case, there were so many sexual assaults going on, not just in Colorado, but throughout the country. And we were having serial killers and rapists come through Colorado a lot. I mean, Ted Bundy came through here, uh, Henry Lee Lucas, Otis Toole, plus we had our own homegrown ones. So we had a whole list of guys that we were having to test their DNA for. And it just, it, it was time consuming. And not all of them were tested. Some of them they were eliminating because, oh, this guy doesn't look like the profile picture, or he wasn't in the state at the time, he says, but they didn't actually do DNA. And so all those ones, I had to look at it with a grain of salt and go, I'm not going to eliminate him just because he said he wasn't there or he didn't fit the profile picture of the composite scope picture. Because for one, we don't know for sure that that was that composite picture actually looked like the guy and they were going off the assumption that it did. So you can't take that assumption. Um, to heart, you have to just go through and go, I need to get their DNA. Who's alive? Who can I collect DNA from? If they're not alive and there's no autopsy that's been done on them, 
who in their family can I test to see if they are a familial match for uh, the, the suspect in this? So he had a lot of work to do, and there was a lot of people that even by the time we saw this, we still didn't get around to finding and getting DNA from. Luckily, we were able to solve it, but that can still take years just to go through that list of people that they had back in 1980. You don't know where those guys are, and some of them were giving you false names back then, so you don't even know. Working again? All right. Perfect. All right. So, uh, like I said, Helen was completing an internship in Denver at KHOW radio station at the time of her murder. Uh, she wanted to go into uh, media communications, and this internship was a, a big part of her finishing up her degree. Uh, she and her friend Kitsy Snow traveled to Colorado um, a week before her internship, where they stayed with her aunt and uncle in Inglewood. Uh, Kitsy came here on an uh, internship for uh, one of the colleges here. Uh, she was doing something with uh, college uh, HR or something. I forget what her what she wanted to do, but she was able to get one out here with uh, Helene, so it was good for the, her to travel with a friend, and so they both came out here at the same time. Um, like I said, while in Colorado, Helene rode the bus to K-House Station in Denver. Uh, unbeknownst to her, a rape had occurred just a week uh, prior to her arrival in Colorado at a bus stop two blocks north of her stop. Uh, like I said, there was a, an active, a couple active serial rapists that were working the South Broadway area all the way from the southern uh, jurisdiction of Denver all the way down uh, to where uh, Inglewood, or Broadway stopped right where 470 is today. Uh, the victim, a 20-year-old female, this is the previous victim uh, a week before her arrival, got off her bus and was grabbed from behind by a white male in his 20s. The suspect was approximately six feet tall and was wearing a green hooded sweatshirt with a hood tied around his face. Um, now, again, that's significant because the piece of uh, makeshift gag that we found around Helen's mouth was a green hooded sweatshirt. And we actually did a lot of investigation on that uh, just to determine where it came from. Um, we found out that the hooded sweatshirt was a, uh, a mail order only item from Sears, the Sears catalog. So that kind of narrowed down uh, the search uh, of suspect, possible suspects, but it still didn't eliminate the fact that he may not, may not even be on that list because it could have been a, a gift from somebody else. It could have been something he picked up at a, a garage sale, but at least it gave us somewhere else to look. Um, so we were able to eliminate most of the people on that list, um, Sears didn't keep their records, all their records for very long, but luckily um, there were a few records that were uh, collected by CBI back in uh, the late 80s from Sears. So we were able to look through that and eliminate pretty much everybody that was on the list uh, of buying a sweatshirt. We couldn't, we never found our suspect's name in that list of, of people that bought that. The, uh, the suspect dragged that uh, the previous victim into an alley where he assaulted her. Um, this suspect, uh, was known for, uh, his, how do you say it? his preferred idea of sexual assault was oral copulation and he would force the females to do that. Um, and so unfortunately, uh, as you know, most of that DNA is gone. Um, and there were very few people that were sexually assaulted by this guy had DNA left that could actually be tested. A couple of them had stomachs pumped, but unfortunately by the time they had uh, called the police, the stomach acids just destroyed any DNA that, that there would have been. Um, like I said, the Inglewood Police Department investigated, but the kit did not yield any DNA that they could use. Uh, on January 16, 1980, Helene left the radio station in Denver. Uh, she left about 5.30, which is uh, the normal time that she left, rode the bus down to uh, Union Street on, in Inglewood, and walked to her aunt and uncle's house. Just after 6 p.m., um, just before Helene's bus arrived at her stop, a 33-year-old female uh, got off another bus two blocks away and was grabbed by our, who we believe was our suspect um, from behind as she walked home. Uh, as in other cases, um, he dragged her into an alley. Um, this victim fell to her knees and screamed and this scared the suspect and he ran away. He was described as wearing a, a green hooded sweatshirt. And uh, on one of the previous ones, like I said, in the alley, we did find a boot print that was very similar to the boot print found at the Helene uh, crime scene. About 20 minutes later, 10 to 20 minutes later, Helene got off her bus and began walking the five blocks to her aunt and uncle's house. Um, when she didn't arrive home by 10.30 p.m., a good four and a half hours later, her aunt reported her missing to a police. 
Um, now, it wasn't that her aunt and uncle didn't think to, to call the police sooner than that, but they waited till Kitsy got home to see if Kitsy knew where she was at. And by the time Kitsy got home and it was already around 1030, then they were worried. I mean, they were already worried, but then they decided it's time to call the police. So at 9 a.m. the following morning, a witness driving on the county road in Douglas County reported the woman's buying body lying about 100 to 200 feet from the roadway. It turned out to be the body of Helene. Uh, this was several miles southeast of where she disappeared. If I remember right, as the crow flies, it was about seven miles altogether. Um, although a large neighborhood now, this is a relatively deserted stretch of road in 1980. Uh, she was found lying face up and was naked from the waist down except for her socks. Her hands were bound behind her back with her own purse strap. And again, like I said, the piece of green sweatshirt material was found around her neck. Um, it was believed that this was used as a makeshift gag. Uh, she had been raped and stabbed in the back uh, nine times, left to bleed to death in the middle of the field. Uh, suspect DNA was found in numerous locations on body and clothing. Uh, the suspect DNA that we did find uh, came from both saliva and semen, and they both uh, came from the same perpetrator. Um, she did not have any defensive wounds, and I'm pretty sure that the reason she didn't have any defensive wounds is from what we knew about her um, when we learned about what she did in college with the rape crisis. We think she was trying to do what she tells the other girls to do, you know, agree with what they want. You're going to make it out alive. And I think that was the, the failing that she had in this is she didn't fight. Because as before, the one right before, the girl screamed and the guy ran away like a, a coward. Um, and then he did this like a coward too. But I think if she would not have cooperated um, like she thought she needed to, she probably would have made it out of this and she wouldn't have died. Uh, again, multiple law enforcement agencies assisted the Douglas County Sheriff's Office in the, our initial investigation, including the Colorado Bureau of Investigation and the Inglewood Police Department. Uh, since she disappeared uh, from Inglewood, they were the initial ones to start the missing persons report, and so they had a lot to do with it as well. Uh, we did follow up on hundreds of leads and tips uh, throughout uh, the decades, and there were more than two dozen detectives at Douglas County Sheriff's Office that uh, worked on this case, including myself over the years. Eventually the leads diminished and the case went cold. Um, when I began uh, in the Sheriff's Office cold case unit in 2017, um, I started working the uh, cold cases and Helen was one of the ones that I really wanted to solve. So I just thought with all the DNA that we, they did have, it was a highly solvable case. Uh, the next year in 2018 with the arrest of the Golden State Killer in California, uh, I went to our sheriff and I said, hey, this is uh, new stuff, but it just happened to catch this guy. What do you think about uh, forking out some money to have us do the same thing? And he was on board with it. So we started using a, a company called Parabon um, that does a lot of uh, genetic genealogy research. Uh, and we, uh, well, I'll get into that in a minute. But uh, investigative genetic genealogy is what we used. It combines the use of crime scene DNA with public genetic DNA testing and traditional genealogy to determine family relationships and predict where a suspect or unidentified person fits in a family tree. This method can be used when there is no DNA hits in the CODIS database for violent crimes, such as homicide, sexual assault, or kidnapping, and to identify human remains. CODIS is the Colorado Offender Database. Um, it's where they place uh, violent felons, uh, have their DNA pulled, and it's entered into CODIS and it's stored. And then, then when you have stuff like this, you enter it, the suspect DNA in the CODIS. And if you get a hit, you're great. You can go and uh, do a retest on that suspect, a real-time retest, and check against it again. Um, you can also get familial matches uh, through CODIS. Say you have a, a guy that you haven't identified through DNA, but his dad or brother were arrested, and theirs is in there. You might get a familial match, and you go, hey, it's not these guys, but they're close relatives to your suspect. So then it gives you somewhere to go on. So uh, I don't know how many of you have heard of GEDmatch, probably quite a few if you're uh, studying crime. But uh, we take a DNA profile from the crime scene. It's uploaded to the free public DNA database called GEDmatch. It's then compared to the database of those who have opted in for law enforcement access. Now, what's uh, good with this case is before GEDmatch uh, started making people actually opt in, everybody was automatically opted in. So we had a huge pool of DNA that we could look at for familial matches to see if anybody was close. Um, but then after us and a few and 
Golden State Killer. A lot of people started complaining, and Jed Match removed everybody from the database of, uh, for uh, law enforcement access, and you had to actually go in and physically opt in. But before they did that, I saved our list of who we had because uh, I didn't want to have to go through all that. I heard it was coming down the pike, so I took our matches, and I pulled them out, and I saved them into a, into a, a PDF file, so I had all that, so I could work for them. Um, a list of DNA matches is generated, and this list is used uh, to build family trees, both back and forward in time, looking for a marriage or relationship where different family networks converge. Basically, what that means is we take our closest DNA matches, which are usually three to four generations out we build a family tree and we go we start with those ones and we work our way back as far as we can and then we backtrack our steps and we work forward and see where we can end up to build this family tree i worked with uh have any of you uh, known about cc moore she's one of the genetic genealogy uh experts in the country um i actually worked with her she worked with parabon and i worked directly with her and she taught me how to do the genetic genealogy and build, building the family trees and so I had a family tree of about 14,000 people that I had built up on this case because I was working on it day and night from home. My wife was mad at me because I didn't have off time when I was working on this case for two years. Every night I was up till 1, 2 in the morning building these family trees and almost got divorced over it. But <laughs> luckily she understood what was going on. I mean, she lived in Inglewood when she was a kid all the way up until I met her. So it was one of those things that hit home for her. So she let, let me work when I needed to work on it. But uh, again, more recently, Family Tree DNA began granting law enforcement access to matches based on users in that, that opt-in. And it's optimal to upload offender raw DNA files to both databases. And there are several companies that can assist with this process. Basically, what that means is we can take the DNA, which we did in Helen Brzezinski's case, uh, semen and saliva samples that were on coats or wherever we got it. Aww. I'll keep explaining it while that goes. But... Uh, we're able to send it into a company that actually takes that physical DNA and they're able to put it into a format that we can put into GEDmatch and the family tree DNA. So then we can upload it. So like with GEDmatch and Ancestry, uh, you spit into a tube, you get the saliva, you, you send it into their lab and they do what they do, work their magic to make it into the format they can upload into there. So that we had a company that would do that for us with the suspect DNA. And uh, that's how we were getting uh, DNA samples into GEDmatch and family tree DNA. You use your... Okay. Did I use my what? If you use your saved... Current case... Is... No, because this happened before. Uh, GEDmatch did the, the opt-in, and even before that, uh, they had a, a, a liability waiver saying that uh, it can be used for things other than uh, family relationship finding for whoever puts it in there. So we were covered by that. Um, I just I couldn't go in there and, and try to get them to turn off the opt-in to, to find more, more than they were letting in for law, opting in for law enforcement. But what I already had, we already had, we were working in good faith, and we were good on that. But but it's a it's a new thing, so you never know what kind of stuff is going to be challenged down the road. But at at the point, we we talked to our DA and a couple other attorneys, and they said, no, you're good with what you got, go with it. So, so I can only work in good faith. <laughs> so. so it wouldn't be fruit from a poison. No, no, not 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 for that one. But uh, again, it is a complex and time consuming consuming process and it took several months for us to even get back what we needed back in a format that we could upload into GEDmatch. And Parabon was able to upload it into GEDmatch for us. They already had a thing worked out with uh, their company. They knew how to do all that. So we just let's run with putting it into GEDmatch. How do you spell Parabon? P-A-R-A-B-O-N. And they, they started out doing other stuff, but then they, when they started getting into the genetic genealogy, they kind of cornered the market right away. And uh, that's what they really became known for. But they were also doing a lot of the stuff where you could send in DNA and you can get, uh, before they were doing the, the GED match stuff, you could get uh, what the possibility of their height, weight, skin tone, eye color, and hair color was. So we were working with that first before we started the other stuff with the genetic genealogy. Um, it is important to note that numerous other suspects were looked at over the years, like I talked about. They were all eliminated through DNA comparison. Um, 
four of the, the big ones that we looked at were uh, two interstate killers, Henry Lee Lucas and Otis Toole, and then two local guys, Kenyon Battles Tollerton and Daniel J. Barney. And I'll explain each of those as we go here. So Henry Lee Lucas, um, an American convicted murderer, he was convicted of murdering his mother in 1960 and the murder of two others in 1983. I don't know if you know much about Henry Lee Lucas, but I bet you do. Um, he was one that uh, liked to he liked to have sex with dead bodies. Unfortunately, he was he was really weird. But uh, he wrote the infamy of a serial killer after he confessed to around 600 other murders after his conviction while in prison. Uh, a lot of detectives went down and interviewed him, including guys from our agency. Um, and they were closing out cases left and right. But then when they started testing his DNA against DNA for the cases that they were closing out, they didn't match. All those cases that he was convict, uh, he was uh, confessing to, <coughs> sorry, he didn't do. He was just getting, because he was getting stuff from the Texas Ranger down there that was feeding him, uh, not feeding him information, but feeding him investigators from out of state because the Texas Ranger was getting a lot of credit and Henry Lucas was getting, uh, you know, not executed yet because he had all this stuff to say. So unfortunately, that Texas Ranger kind of took advantage of that and heard a lot of cases when he did that. Uh, Otis Tool was uh, Henry Lucas' uh, confidant, his sometimes lover, and his uh, partner in crime. I don't know if you guys know that he was he's the most likely suspect in the Adam Walsh killing. You know how they, how they figured oh. out he was a, a killer of Adam Walsh? Uh, well, when his car was seized uh, back during uh, his crimes in Florida, and he had some other places that he went to, but they found a uh, a towel on the back seat of his car or the floorboard of his car. And when they were looking at it, there was a, a face imprint in blood. And when they looked at the face imprint on the towel and matched it to Adam Walsh's photo, it was Adam Walsh's face. He had carried around Adam Walsh's head in his car and disposed of the body, they ended up disposing of the head later. But that's how they determined that he killed Adam Walsh. They found the, the blood imprint of Adam Walsh's face in that towel on the, on the floorboards. Uh, the detective that worked that case actually wrote a book about it and, it and described everything about it. It's actually a really good book. If I remember what it is, I'll let you guys know. But uh, Kenyon uh, Battles Tollerton, he was a local guy in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, he was found guilty of murdering Donna Waugh, who uh, lived in an apartment across the parking lot from him. Um, he was later uh, convicted, and after he died, his DNA was linked to a 14-year-old girl whose body was found in 1993, which is 13 years later after he was convicted of his, uh, his other murder. So we think there's probably more victims, but unfortunately there might not have been DNA left for those other victims. Uh, Daniel J. Barney. He was a suspected serial rapist. Him and his brother, they kind of worked as a, as a rapist team. They were from Idaho. Um, they got caught, or he got caught at least in Wisconsin, was jailed uh, for a sexual assault. I run out of battery here before. Um, he was caught uh, in Wisconsin, was on trial, or went to trial, was waiting for sentencing for that case. He escaped, came out to Denver. So maybe we can maybe put that in another one. My battery just died. Sorry. Sorry about that. But uh, Daniel J. Barney, he came to Colorado after he escaped him and his brother. And we believe, because uh, other DNA matches, those uh, peripheral sexual assaults we were talking about along Broadway, not on the street themselves, but on the secondary streets, his DNA matched several of them. We think him and his brother, mostly him by himself, but his brother helped on a couple of them, um, were committing those peripheral sexual assaults. Um, they were, him, his brother and him were uh, cornered in a condo in Denver in 1981 or 82. Um, they ended up, uh, one of the victims in the house was able to untie themselves, called the police. Police came. Uh, some of the victims escaped from the condo, and then Daniel Barney shot himself. Um, the brother was able to escape, was later captured, but uh, we had DNA from Daniel Barney the same way. Um, for our case that I did with the, the cousin's husband, we were able to get a slide from the autopsy and test it against our DNA for Helen Przinsky's case, uh, and it ended up not being a match. Sorry about that. I thought my battery was going to last longer. Got my power cord. I, I left the house in such a hurry I forgot the power cord. <laughs> but this will work, yeah.
Yep, and we can go to the next one after this. So uh, after decades of ne negative matches, in 2019, we finally developed a, a suspect in Helene's murder. Familial DNA search companies, Parabon and United Data Connect, which you guys know Mitch Morrissey, the former DA, DA of Denver. Um, he now, that's his company, United Data Connect. So because um, he's more local, our sheriff wanted to use us, someone more local because Parabon's based in Virginia. And so we wanted to have somebody that we could call and have them come down and look at stuff on a moment's notice. So we started using United Data Connect. Um, we were able to triangulate between two different family networks for the suspect. And this process identified the suspect's mother and eventually determined she had at least six children with three different men. Uh, two of her children were daughters, two of her sons were too young at the time of Helene's murder, and only one of her two older sons had ever lived in Colorado. On a side note, which is kind of strange when you're working a case like this, uh, when I put my DNA into GEDmatch, because um, I was trying to find my birth family on my dad's side, because my dad was adopted, I didn't know any of my family, um, I actually came up as a match, uh, a distant match for this suspect. <laughs> so I was like a fourth or fifth generation away. So I'm still working on my family tree just to see where I triangulate, but I've, I figured it down um, in the Estes Wall side of his family on my dad's side of the family, which I ended up figuring out all my side of that family. But I'm somewhere down the line, I'm related to this guy. So that kind of made me want to solve this case even more. So I'm like, somebody in my family did this? I was hoping, when I first did it, I was hoping it wasn't going to be someone that was really close to me because <laughs> that would be awkward. But I mean, if you're going to have to arrest them, you got to do what you got to do. But, okay, so the next slide, please. Thank you. So the investigation revealed that the suspect, Curtis Allen White, had absconded from parole for a 1975 rape charge in Arkansas, where additionally he used a knife in that case too. He had changed his name to James Curtis Clanton using a different date of birth. And by 2019, when we discovered who he was, he was living in Lake Butler, Florida, where he was working as an in-state truck driver. Uh, in December of, the, of 2019, uh, detectives went down and got a DNA sample from Clanton's beer mugs. And we're going to call him Clanton now because that's what he had changed his name to, um, and that's what he's still using. Um, but Clanton's beer mugs after spending an afternoon at a local bar. We had a couple of our guys that worked uh, undercover um, in our drug unit uh, with Douglas County. They went down and they were working their undercover stuff, following him. And when they saw that he had been drinking from a, a glass mug in a bar, they when the guy left, they grabbed that and they flew it back to Colorado. Uh, they had one person fly it back and they did an expedited uh, match on that to see if it matched and it came back as a match. Um, and I'll, we'll try the videos later. But he did confess to it on the trip back to Colorado. Yeah, he said that on the day of Helene's murder, went blank. <laughs> <laughs> It happens. Oh. Believe me, in law enforcement, you realize things like this happen. Oh, thank you. Just don't want them at home falling asleep before we get to the good stuff. <laughs> it's almost done, though. I'd say we probably got five to ten slides left. Sorry, and there's no way to really cut this down anymore without losing some of the vital information on the case. It's like 48 slides. I was trying to get it to down to 30, but I was like, I can't cut out that stuff because that's the good stuff. Okay, so uh, Clanton said on the day of Helene's murder, he had a meeting with his parole officer in Denver. He doesn't know exactly what set him off, and he didn't know when he crossed the threshold, but something set him off, and he decided that was it. Um, what's important that's not in here that I, I should have put in here was uh, a guy that he was living with in Colorado. The reason he was here was when he lived in Arkansas, um, there was a guy who was a preacher in the jail, and it kind of became his mentor. And so he moved out here um, and was living with the mentor and the mentor's wife and kids, and the mentor was trying to help him. The pastor worked at a church in Inglewood, and uh, he would have Clanton come and help him clean up stuff at the church, and the church is one street over from the path that Helen took home. And so he decided that he was going to, sexually assault a woman that night. He was mad. The parole officer was giving him cuff, and he decided that's it. I'm, I need I need a release, and that's how he released himself. He said it as he was driving home from well, in the Initially, he said as he was driving home from the parole meeting, he saw Helene getting off the bus, but later he changed that and said he had went to the church, 
was still pissed off, decided to drive around and saw Helen walking home down the dark street, and that's when he took her. So he had two different stories, but they were really close to each other. They he wasn't lying. I think he's just he was trying to remember exactly how it happened. He said he car walked up to her and showed her the knife. She quietly walked back with him to the car where he put her on the floorboard and tied her up. Again, I think she was doing what she was teaching the other students to do to cooperate and everything's going to be fine, um, which, as you know, it's not. <laughs> it never is fine when you cooperate with somebody like that. But he drove her several miles uh, south to a woodshed. They say it was on a secluded road in Douglas County, but the woodshed we found out later was actually uh, just across the line in uh, Arapahoe County. Um, he raped her uh, in the back yard there at that house, then drove her to the secluded road in Douglas County, where we think he raped her again, because um, there was semen on the ground and on her clothes at the field, and that's where he stabbed her and, and left her to die. Uh, so here, uh, he said at that point he had planned on letting her go, but then something snapped. He described stepping out of himself, and he stabbed her in the back numerous times. Um, when we did a uh, we worked the coroner and a couple other detectives that had a lot of experience in homicide investigation, and we determined that the way the stab wounds are on the back, he was standing in front of her or she was kneeling in front of him, and he stabbed her from over in, into the back while he was facing her. That's how the, the knife wounds were in there. He said he was afraid that he would go back to jail if he let her go. He said he never intended on stabbing her, but it happened. He also said that he was going to let her walk away and let her go just like the rest of them that something inside him snapped and he could not believe he was stabbing her. That statement where he said, uh, I was just going to let her go like the rest of them, that led us to believe. He never admitted to the other ones along Broadway, but they were so similar, same clothing, same boots, and he let those ones go. And then him saying that just cemented in our mind he probably did. We just we were never going to be able to prove that without him saying he did. So, like again, although he denies involvement in other rapes, including the attack minutes before Helene's, he did say, I was going let to go, let her go just like the rest of them. Unfortunately, we never know the full extent of his crimes because he's just not going to tell us. Um, so we have a picture from him in the 1980s next to the composite sketch, and it's an eerie resemblance. So, I mean, a few small things, but for the lady that did the hypnosis for this sketch, good on her because that's pretty close. I mean, that's good. She even talked about the Adam's apple, and he had a, a, a prominent Adam's apple. So Clanton was arrested in December 2019. Um, so the blonde girl on the right is Helen's only living relative, uh, Janet uh, Przinsky Johnson. Um, I worked with her on this case. Um, I was one of the notifying her of her stuff. But uh, at her request, I sat with her at the, at the sentencing. She wanted me to be there for that. By that time, I'd already left the Douglas County Sheriff's Office, and I was working for the DA's office. But she personally asked me to sit with her at the sentencing, so I, I can't turn her down. <laughs> Uh, so, Kitsy Snow, the girl that came out there with her, spoke at the sentencing hearing and read journal entries from that night. Um, it was hard to read the, the journey, journal entries when we were doing the initial investigation because you could just tell the worry and froth that just Kitsy had, not alone Helen's family. But you can go to the next one unless they want to read those. So again, like here, I don't know if we should call the police. I think we should call them, or the, the parents, or her mom and dad who were still in Massachusetts. But Kitsy was saying, if it was my daughter, I'd want to know. I mean, that's heart-wrenching, knowing everything else. But on Wednesday, July 1st, 2020, he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Although accused of raping Helen, uh, he was not charged with sexual assault because of an expired statute of limitations, the way the, the laws were worded in 1980. Um, we were trying, but we just couldn't do it. We, but we at least we got him for the, the homicide, and he's in prison for life. And he has a daughter now who's devastated by this. I mean, how could you not be? But this, is, uh, this was a, the sentencing where uh, Janet was talking um, at the sentencing. If we can get it to run where you can hear it, I'll show these videos. Uh, this is Helen in memoriam, April 15th, 1958 to January 16th, 1980. Poor girl. That's the uh, the case I'm most proud of. I did a lot in that case, and it came, even though some of it came to fruition after I left the, the sheriff's office, I don't think it would have got there without all of us working the case as a team. I mean, that's what it takes. No one person can do it. There's no way I could have done this on my, on my own. I had a piece of it, and I'm just happy to have been part of it. So that's that. I hope the presentation was good. If we can figure out the, the videos, I can have you watch the videos. I can put those links in.
Yeah, that'll work great. Yeah, that's perfect. So hopefully, everybody at home could hear me. Hear the different <clears throat> investigators, branches have different relationships with the law enforcement agencies. That there's And I'm sure this varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. At what point would, say, Detective Bureau hand off a case, say, to the DA's investigators to follow up, like you did on the on the cold cases, or or to obviously to prep it for trial? Well, I can tell you, uh, as a D, even with the 18th as a DA investigator. Um, the only wait time that we used DA investigators was when we had a massive case that we needed to follow up help on, and they'd go out with one of our detectives and interview people. Um, with the cold cases, I really didn't use uh, DA investigators. I used other detectives uh, within my agency. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the 18th does with their investigators now, um, but then we only called them if, like, if I was really overwhelmed. I had a COCA case where I worked with 13 suspects, and they were hitting stuff stealing cars and shooting at people in every jurisdiction in the metro area. And that was so big, I took over cases from multiple jurisdictions. Um, I needed help with that one. And so a couple of DA investigators came out and went and interviewed a couple of possible suspects and a few witnesses and helped me out with that. But ultimately, I'd get their report, but it was on me. I'd, I'd have them help me, but all the investigation was, was mine to do. Detective. So as a DA's investigator, you wouldn't typically go behind Beth's back to, to uh, try to get her brother Danny to help you solve the case. No, um, <laughs> if I like my job, I wouldn't do that. No. And I think that's with any DA. You don't go behind your boss. I mean, I don't care if you work at McDonald's. If you go behind your boss's right. back and do something, you're going to get fired or at least in trouble. But uh, no, you don't. You, you don't do that type of stuff. You have a just like police and military. You have a strict. Uh, chain of command that you follow. So Anthony on Blue Boats is fictionalized. Yeah, I'd say almost any show that you watch is pretty fictionalized, and they're doing a lot of stuff that people would be prosecuted for <laughs> for doing behind their boss's back. But no, and that's what you got to take a grain of salt with all the, the movies sure. and the and the TV shows. They're fun to watch. I mean, I enjoy watching them, but I'm looking at it going, yeah, we'd never do that. <laughs> Didn't typically work closely. Uh, no, um, as a detective, I worked with other detectives and then a few times with DA investigators. As a DA investigator with Denver, um, the only thing I'm really doing with uh, the detectives is sometimes I'll call them and talk to them about the case when I'm getting ready. We're prepping it for trial or I need some other, something was, wasn't put into the DA file. I'll call them and say, hey, we need this. But other than that, the DAs, uh, I mean, the detectives do most of the follow-up work. We're usually... Uh, relegated to talking to witnesses and victims as DA investigators we don't usually talk to suspects that's all that's all been done because if it hasn't been done enough to send it to the DA to get ready for trial then it wouldn't be sent to us at all or we reject it so you need to do more follow-up on this detective so that's their job Uh, not in the 1980s, but luckily CBI was pretty on top of it. They were collecting DNA from a lot of a lot of cases. Um, a lot of it they were doing because they could do at least blood typing, and blood typing was big, big back then. So they would collect DNA for blood typing. They didn't know about the upcoming DNA, but luckily they collected it because it helped solve cases later. I think it's one of those things that that God said, "Hey, I'm going to have you do this. You may not know why, but I have a plan." So it's one of those things. You never know. You know, not as much, but back in the 80s, it was a different era. Yeah. <laughs> I was When I actually saw it, that was the first case and only case that I've ever known where they've done hypnosis on a, on a witness. And I was like, that's a good idea. But, it seems to have worked pretty well. But I, I mean, you have too many movies like The Stir Echoes. You get hypnotized and then you're possessed or something. I don't know. <laughs> so... But yeah. Jason, on the report, said that's the FBI profile. They said it most likely did not know. Determine that. You know, 
the FBI behavioralists don't tell us all their secrets or how they come to stuff, but if you look at just about every FBI profile for serial killers and the type, you're going to see almost the exact same wording for everyone, and that's one of the, the bullet points they have. I mean, it's kind of – I hate to say it, but it's kind of a generalized template with a few changes, but it's pretty much white male, 25 to 35 at the time, and then with all, and that's one of the, the major bullet points. But it was true in this case. So it was still a bullet point that we use, but it was just one of those generalized templates that Douglas used. They always live in the basement with their mom. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, this guy lived in the basement with his mentor, I guess. <laughs> You know, um, knowing how many times families are contacted with, hey, we might have something, and it turns out to be nothing, I usually don't contact the family unless, one, I need to have them tell me about something that we need to look into, or we get close enough to a suspect that I can go, okay, let's drop the bomb on them. Because I don't want to keep calling them, hey, we're looking at this guy, and then it didn't turn out to be him. And then next week, hey, we're looking at this guy, because that's an up-and-down roller coaster, especially – after 40 years, you, your daughter's case hasn't been solved. Even though they were really good with us about knowing that we're, we're looking, it's hard to not believe that the victim's family isn't going, you guys aren't doing squat. It's been 40 years. You haven't found anything. And it's hard to explain to them, we just don't have anything yet because we don't have it. I mean, it's just, it's not there. But to call them every week and say, hey, we got this or that, that's too much. You're going to have family members, unfortunately, that are going to break, they're going to kill themselves, they're going to die from something. You, you can't do that to people. So you wait until you have something. When you, when I'm to the point where I go, this is the guy, I'm 99.9% .9 sure this is the guy, then I might call the family. But if I don't have to call the family until we get a, a match, then I'm not going to call the family because I don't want to put them through that. What's that? Yeah, I talked to Janet because we had to find – um, one, we didn't know where that cousin was that had been married to that guy we needed to look for. So we needed to find her, and we needed to find the uh, the husband. And unfortunately, I had to break the news to her, hey, we're looking at him as a possible suspect because of his history. And actually, what was good was it didn't surprise her um, with him, but uh, I had to contact her because I had no other way to find these two. She had, the cousin had changed her name after she divorced this guy and disappeared. And so there was no way for me to find her except to go through Janet, and I was able to find her through Janet. That was quite a while before you actually. Uh, yeah, that was probably a year, year and a half before I found Clan. Janet. Yeah, yeah. and um, luckily with Janet, um, she understood what was going on. She actually sent me a friend request on Facebook, and I was kind of leery to accept it because you don't want to get close with the family. But you know, there were so many things I needed to talk to her about. I went ahead and accepted the friend request and uh, we started talking on, and I got to know the family more. It was good for me too. Cause I got to know Helene's family more. The parents were already dead. The aunt and uncle were dead. Uh, her brother was dead. So it was good in that respect. I'm still friends with her on Facebook. And, but it was just one of those times that you kind of, you kind of got to bend the rules a little bit for that. Well, for the first guy that I said, we think we got, um, because we, we, we told her once with another guy who actually matched the composite sketch even more than that, and he was a guy that was in Colorado for a short time going to the Colorado School of Mines, and he disappeared right after the murder happened, and his friends don't know why he disappeared. He ended up uh, in Arizona. We found him later. Um, we went and got DNA from him, and it ended up not being him. Um, but I had to tell her because we were so close on that one, and everything matched, even the uh, C.C. Moore, because he, he had actually – same mother's name as our suspects, that one that ended up being the suspect's mother's name, wow. and he was in the same area of the family tree. So he could have very well could have been the guy, so we had to kind of tell her, say, we're, this is what we got going on, we'll get back with you. So that was hard, that was devastating, but, um, you know, when we didn't con tell her about the new suspect because what had just happened with the other one, we didn't tell her until we got the match back, and then we told her. And what did she say? Um, she cried, I mean, who wouldn't, but yeah, she was... We had to let her go and take a couple days to calm down and then call us back and then we had a better conversation. I wasn't involved in that second conversation. Um, I was already gone by then. But uh, from what I hear, she was uh, very appreciative, and she still is.
You know, if uh, I have to say, if I wasn't a detective for so many years in law enforcement for so many years, and I knew it was ha- it was going to happen that way. It'd probably be pretty frustrating. But I kind of already had it in my mind. I knew we were going to have to prosecute on 1980 rules, and sometimes a hit or miss. I mean, this time at least we had the the homicide charge that would give him a, a life sentence. But I mean, heck, you have kidnapping and sexual assault. Kidnapping alone these days is a felony that doesn't have an expiration. Um, like it did back in 1980, a statute of limitations, but back then it did. So you couldn't even charge them with the kidnapping So back then. But they changed that. And a lot of sex assaults, have, they've added on 10 years to, to the statute of limitations just because of stuff like this. Because uh, I think the sexual assault one was here may have been a little more than 10 years uh, expired, but it wasn't, it wasn't 40 years expired, that's for sure. It was just, it was a lot closer. Other questions? I have one. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Um, you said uh, obviously the body was found in the field. How much physical evidence can you get from a field? Can you pick up blood? Is there, I mean, you said there was tire tracks and boot prints. If it had been snowing, would that have ruined the evidence? It, it might not have ruined the evidence, but we got lucky. Um, with this case, she was found the next morning, and it was cold that night, so the DNA was kind of half frozen. Um, but if snow had covered it, it'll snow will ruin some things. But a lot of people don't realize that even with a dog track, um, if it's raining or snowing after a person goes, that's actually better for a dog track. It keeps that stuff low to the ground, the, the scent. Um, rain will really ruin uh, some of your DNA, your blood, your semen, saliva, but not necessarily snow. Because snow, when it hits the ground, um, it'll keep that stuff that's between the ground and the snow really preserved. Um, it won't start melting yet. Um, and as further it gets on, it just keeps it colder. At some point, it'll degrade it. But initially, if you get it fairly quickly, that snow actually protects a lot of your DNA. The rain and firemen, firemen ruin your crime scene because they're coming in spraying stuff down. <laughs> but rain and firemen, those are what I hate. But everything else dirt, works pretty good. The dirt isn't a problem. I'm sorry. Sorry, sorry. The dirt isn't a problem. No, dirt's not a problem because if you if you think about it, um, bodily fluids um, will may seep into the dirt, but that turns into mud, and you can separate mud from DNA. Um, the labs can do that pretty easy now. I mean, they can they can separate three different guys' DNA on a on a rape kit um, where a girl's been sexually assaulted by three people, and they can get the DNA for each of the guys separated, and they're all commingled. So dirt's kind of the same thing. It sounds gross, but you just take the mud or the dried dirt, you send it to the lab, and they do their thing. Presto bango, and you got your DNA sample. It's actually kind of – I think dirt actually helps because it, it preserves that stuff from getting washed away. I mean, it, it cakes in with the dirt, and it just stays there. Cool. Thank you. No problem. Any other questions out there? I got another one if no one else does. Sure. Uh, how long has Denver had, Denver DAs had invest, their own investigators? You know, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I know they've been there at least 16 years. So I know a guy that uh, retired from Denver PD and has been an investigator there for 16 years. So I know they've had him for at least 16. Okay. But I didn't check up on that. I didn't know I was going to be asked that. Sorry. Damn those history mystery writers. I know. It's those pop quizzes. Any others? Not a problem. Thank you.